Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this lovely Monday morning. This kicks off our part of our webinar series that we're offering as we get started for the fall 2021 semester. And today for the 10 o'clock session that you're in now, we're going to be looking at some collaborative tools that are in B2L and beyond B2L. And this is really meant to be an opportunity to inspire you to think about how to use some collaboration and also some of the tools that we have that can get you started with that practice. Our agenda for the time that we're going to be spending together today, we're going to discuss a little bit about the value of collaboration and looking at when collaboration is our most effective option. And then we're going to move into D2L and then some of the tools that we feature beyond D2L. And then we're gonna wrap up this 10 o'clock session here with considerations and some next steps. So as we get started, please feel free to use the chat if you have any questions and I'll try to monitor those as they come in. And then at the end of the session, we'll also have some time for you to ask any specific questions. The entire CTLE team is here. So we'll be able to answer any questions that you might have about the tools that are mentioned. So we'll go ahead and get started by thinking about the value of collaboration. What we know is that collaboration for collaboration's sake is not something that we want to do. Some of the tasks and assignments and activities in our classes are really not meant to be collaborative, but there are a lot of benefits to the ones that are. When we look at collaborative spaces and learning, what we're really looking at is an opportunity to find some value in why we're going to group students together. So first of all, it's a way to engage our students. It's very easy in bigger classes for some students to disappear into the background sometimes during discussions or class activities. However, as we use small groups, what we see is that students have to become more engaged with their partners that are in the groups with them. Now, this also works to build community. And this is something I think all of us are really looking into right now after the events of the last year and a half. We're trying to figure out how can we connect our students and build a sense of community regardless of the different modalities that we're teaching in. And along those lines with modalities, really today I'm going to be looking at some of the tools that can be implemented very easily into face-to-face -face or hybrid classes. But I think the same tools and tips and tricks apply to any class, even if you're teaching fully online. So do keep that in mind as we are talking about some of these different tools. We also see that with collaboration, this improves accountability. We know from research that students are much less likely to miss assignments and miss deadlines and not do their part of the work if they also have to answer to their peers. So this has a really interesting phenomenon that we see where students want to be held accountable to each other. And they often, when they're working in small groups, feel that sense of accomplishment as they're doing the assignments. When we look at collaboration, we also talk about supporting these complex problem solving skills. This is one of the areas where we look at collaborative assignments and activities, and we think about when they're the most useful. For simple tasks, for tasks that are managed very well by one student, we don't want to put those into collaborative situations. We found that that actually kind of bogs down our work and it also makes the students less interested. However, when we're looking at complex situations and complex problems, it's always better to have that element of collaboration so that our students can work together and they can learn from each other as well. Next, with value of collaboration, we're really thinking about ways to connect social and emotional learning to our cognitive learning. We know that students learn well when there are social aspects to it, so they can brainstorm, bounce ideas off of each other. They are able to see things from a different point of view than perhaps they were when they entered the discussion with their peers. And it's also emotional in the sense that they form connections to each other. And as students feel emotionally invested in topics, they're much more likely to continue to develop their ideas around them. And then finally, we see that collaboration can really help develop critical thinking skills. Critical thinking is often pretty hard to teach, but one of the ways that we see value in collaboration is that it does improve critical thinking skills. The students are exposed to different ideas and different ways of looking at different topics. And through that, they're able to really get together and develop some of those skills that they may not have been able to do on their own. It supports our metacognitive processes in really great ways. So we all can think of some of the values of collaboration and when we can use it for those topics that are difficult to grapple with or those types of assignments that have a lot of key components to them that are very difficult for one student to do on their own. 
So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at some of the tools that will make things a bit easier for you and more effective for your students. Let's first talk about good old D2L. So we're going to look at some tools that you're probably familiar with, but perhaps we can see things in a different light after our discussion today. In the D2L environment, we have several ways where students can collaborate. So I'm gonna highlight four of those. We're going to look specifically under activities at discussions, assignments, groups, and Zoom. When we talk about discussion boards, we often think of them as this static place where we use the same prompts often. We sometimes even worry about whether or not students are finding the material online to answer our discussion boards. And often, depending on when students post, they may not feel very collaborative at all. And that's really what we wanna think about is how can we in turn these discussion boards, move them away from these static places where people don't really interact to situations where there's a lot of lively discussion and that community is formed. When we look at reimagining what our discussion boards can do, just thinking about your own discussions that you've used in your classes, consider these other ways to approach them. We're gonna look at some brainstorming and questioning techniques for using discussion boards, considering them places to curate resources, and responding to readings. When we think about our face-to-face -face classes, when everybody's back into that synchronous setting, we go back to some of the same questions we have about how do we prepare our students and how do they come to class prepared to talk about what we need to discuss that day. Consider your discussion board as a place that has an assignment built in where students are responding to the readings ahead of time. This is also a great way to reinforce learning by having students share key takeaways so you can have a discussion forum set up to where at the end of the class, the students will go in and they will post to the discussion board about what they took away from that day. For anyone who uses group projects or small group projects throughout the semester, your discussion boards provide you with a place where they can commit their project planning, they can review each other's work, and all of this is available to you and to all of the other peers that are in their classes. So something like that offers an opportunity for students to connect in a space that's transparent and you can jump in and help at any time that you need. And then thinking about case studies and scenarios. When we're working in a lot of our courses, we see the use of a high use of case studies and scenarios. Considering the discussion boards as a place where students can take on different personas and different roles once they're on the discussion board and they're posting. Again, that harkens back to our ability to help with critical thinking skills and form that connection between students. There are just a couple of these that I want to touch on as we think about creative ways to collaborate in our D2L space. With brainstorming and questioning, with major assignments, students often have a lot of questions and those typically will come to you in one-on-one -on -one conversations or emails. Yet a lot of times we know that those questions are probably questions that other students in the class have. So instead of the students emailing you directly or meeting with you in some form of face-to-face -face environment, think about using a discussion forum to have students brainstorm. Let them put down their questions, their ideas, anything that they have that's related to the specific project. That way you can answer the questions and the rest of the class can see them. This will save you a little bit of time and it will help get the students used to going to the discussion board to find some ideas and to share some thoughts. Also consider activation activities, having students post questions before class. When we talk about having students prepared for our classes, one way that we can help to support the reading and making sure that they've reviewed the materials and we don't have those opportunities where everyone just sits around in the class and doesn't say anything because they haven't done the reading. Instead, ask them to do a simple activation activity where they post any kind of questions ahead of time before class. And then anyone who uses debates, this is a great space for students to be able to post the pro con statements or any sort of questions they have. And they can expect to receive responses from either their peers or from you, depending on how you have it set up. This takes away a lot of that on the spot pressure that students feel, and it helps to prepare them better for your live class sessions. When we think about case studies and scenarios, one way to approach this in a discussion forum in D2L to support collaboration is to assign students different roles to respond to the case studies and to the scenarios. 
depending on your discipline and what you're teaching at the moment, you may have case studies that look at these complex topics and projects. What we can do is to assign the students the roles. You can do that during class time. And then on the discussion board, they can post their responses to the case studies or the scenarios based on their specific roles or the personas that you've asked, asked them to adapt. Now, we also want to think about how this could even prepare us for class meetings as well. Students can then review the post of their peers ahead of time, and that will create more robust conversations during class. So using these discussions in really different ways. So we have to address the why. So why would we use discussions in a course where we meet live or we meet synchronously or even face-to-face? -face? And there's a lot of reasons why we would still want to use our discussion boards in B2L. One is that it allows more time to process information. Not all students are going to want to respond in the moment to the questions that are being raised. And we've all been in situations where we're really hoping that the conversation becomes more robust and more well-developed. And in something like that, the discussion forum gives all of your learners the opportunity to think about what's been said, to consider the readings, to consider other points of view. And it's much easier for them. And the cognitive process is very different if they're asked to write out their responses and then respond to each other all in the discussion forum. So it creates a more inclusive environment for your students because they aren't the, the students who aren't as likely to jump in right away to conversations and respond. They have an opportunity to think about what they want to say before they put their ideas down to share with the class. If you're working with discussion forums ahead of your class meetings, this can also help to support your in-class discussion. This gives you the opportunity to have a, the students have conversations about the topics and the ideas prior to the class lecture. And then ultimately, this creates a much more prepared environment for your students. They're able to see the ideas and connect the topics. And then that way, during class, the conversations can really be focused on how to develop the ideas. Before we move into groups, I did want to mention, if you are interested in discussion boards, that is another one of our webinars that we have coming up a little later today, where we'll spend the entire time talking about some different creative ways to use discussion boards. So if you are interested in learning more about how to use discussion boards in different ways, make sure you join us for our webinar a little later today as well. Now, our second point that we wanna look at are D2L groups. So when we look at groups, this one, oh, and we do, we have Cheryl in the room and I see that she just posted. Professor Kazina, hello, hello, welcome. I'm actually using one of your examples here. Um, Cheryl is a master of group work. So we're very lucky to have her here today. And uh, one of the ways that she has presented uh, before with us here in the CTLE is looking at using the group feature in D2L. And this gives the opportunity for you to create assignments or discussions and organize them by categories. And as you are creating these assignments and discussions, if these are ones that you think would be better managed in small groups rather than as individual students, it's actually quite easy to set up in D2L. You can link these to grade items and any member of the group can submit the assignment. Now for you, this is also very helpful because you're only grading one submission. So if you have small groups of three to four students, you can assign them all the same grade, that you can all get the same feedback and you're only grading that one project. Now in certain situations, you may want to adjust the grades for the individuals in the group and that's okay too. You're welcome to do that. And all of these things can be managed right through D2L as you set up your small group spaces. And then since we have Professor Kazina with us, did you want to add anything as far as your experiences using D2L groups, any tips or tricks that you wanted to share? No, I mean, I would just add kind of what you're saying that, you know, if you have a group assignment where maybe someone didn't contribute as much, there's nothing saying you can't go in and adjust that in the gradebook later. So this is a great way to streamline grading, like Melissa said. <laughs> um, I usually have five or six groups in my classes of 25, much easier to grade five or six assignments than 25. Um, so it's been a real nice way to streamline for me, but you can still make adjustments as needed. So I, I found it to be really helpful for that. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's great. I love groups. <laughs> so, they may not like it as much, but I do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. We're very lucky to, to have you with us today to add those insights. And you'll see here, I've actually taken a, a screenshot that Professor Kazina shared with us before about exactly how that grading works. And you'll notice in this particular scenario, she has completed the grading here and then the feedback and then able to grade as well. But then all of that can be adjusted. So it's a very, very useful tool and, and quite easy to use once you are in the D2L environment and you have your categories and your assignments all set up. You can assign the groups and it can create a, a much more streamlined process. And um, I've used this in discussions as well whenever I felt like the class was just a bit too big for the discussions to be 25 students responding to a single prompt. You can separate them out in the discussion area as well. So a lot of really, really neat features for supporting group work in the D2L environment. Yes, absolutely. So we have another comment. Uh, use groups too in those large classes. It helps with better feedback. Absolutely. Absolutely. Georgina, did you want to add anything? Feel free to unmute your mic and jump in if you have any thoughts or suggestions or tips for everybody. No, I just wanted to say um, because when we have 20, 25 students and you're looking at the same assignment, 25 different times, I think that we, you know, lose some of that uh, really good subjective um, and, you know, valuable feedback because we're reading the same thing over and over and over. So I like groups because I can focus on five different assignments and do really, really good feedback in the feedback rather than try to rush through grading 25 assignments. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you, Professor. Absolutely. And so that's a, another great point to mention when we look at groups and if, if anybody's feeling overwhelmed with the amount of grading, also thinking about how that can help help us as we're going through grading. And as, as Professor just said, we see that through this process, we can leave much better feedback because we're maybe not quite as tired from reading all of the same papers. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And then with D2L, one other point that I wanted to bring up are some of the tools that are already built into D2L. So these aren't ones that you have to integrate yourself. They're already there. You just have to find them in the system. And this first one is PeerMark. And this is through Turnitin. So if you have any Turnitin enabled assignments, and we in the CTLE can help you with that if you have, do you have any questions about how to use Turnitin. From there, you can go into your add existing activities. If you have your D2L shell open, you can look at this now. When you scroll through the existing activities, you do see something called Turnitin Peer Mark. This is a peer review platform where students will be assigned other papers in their class to read and review. Now, this is something I've used a, a, a lot of peer review over the years and everything from having students bring their papers to class and change them to working through Word documents, peer review, tons of different opportunities for this. And it's something that's really great, again, if you have your students doing multiple drafts of projects or if you have projects where you want your students working on things and getting feedback before you come in and give feedback, this is a great opportunity. And you can see just from this information, uh, you can assign the points and put in your testing. There's the opportunity to pose certain questions. So a lot of times these types of questions could be related to your rubric. So you could ask questions that are similar to the different criteria that you'll have on your rubric. And then you can set specific guidelines for when students are able to access their peers' papers, how many they receive through the distribution process, and then set open and close windows. And so this can be an assignment that takes place fully asynchronously, yet it still allows for that opportunity for collaboration. And if you're someone who's teaching live and normally would devote class time to peer review, this removes that. And this puts it into a scenario where students are able to do this on their own time. So PeerMark is a really great tool that's part of the Turnitin package already in your D2L classes. And then I feel like this goes without saying, um, but don't forget about Zoom and using Zoom in ways that are a bit more creative. It doesn't always have to be for you to lecture. 
This can also be an opportunity for students to get together and work on project planning, um, especially valuable at this point where it's hard for students to all be together. Or if you're teaching a fully online class, this gives students the opportunity to set up a, a chance to plan with each other and meet in this environment that allows them to connect. They all have Zoom accounts as well. So just thinking about how that can work. And then the other point I wanted to say about Zoom was considering how your students are going to do presentations. Now, as we are sort of in uncertain times about the upcoming semester and as we're trying to plan out all of these different modifications to our classes, one of the things we can think about is not getting rid of presentations. We don't wanna get rid of our student presentations, but perhaps we don't have the class time allotted for it or we're concerned about when the students are going to be in our classes, a, a variety of questions that we may have. So something that you can set up is have the students record their presentations in Zoom, and then they can share their links on the discussion board. This is something that I've done with quite a bit of success, and I think it created a, a more inclusive environment and a more engaging environment because then students could watch each other's presentations and respond to them. Let's see, we have a couple of comments here I do want to address in the chat. Let's take a look. Uh, Professor Russo there loves Turnitin. Great, so the writing classes and try peer mark. It's, it's really a, a good opportunity, uh, Gianna, if you are in a situation where you don't have the class time or you want your students to complete peer reviews out of, out of class for some reason, definitely try out peer mark. And then it looks like Cheryl's used it in Georgina. Yes, role playing, using Zoom for role playing and enactment of practical processes. This is something when we think about the different types of learning that happens during uh, collaborative environments and looking at how students learn, whether it's um, through emotional learning or cognitive learning or these different ways that they can react in situations. So we're getting that physical exploration of how they're reacting to situations too, which is really interesting. So using Zoom as a way to capture that through video and then to share out. I, I know in situations for students, especially in classes of 25 or so, if all the students are doing presentations, uh, they may not all in the audience be as engaged as we would like, but by sharing them out on the discussion board as recording, having a certain set of questions that they respond to, these are all great ways to create some collaboration between your students in an environment that allows them to process the information at the speed at which they need to. And then Melissa, let's I just see. want to jump in, sorry, sure. and really yeah, sell the peer mark. So many, many years ago, because I've been in St. Leo for a while, we used to just have turn it in separate. It wasn't integrated in the LMS. And we used PeerMark religiously, me and my colleagues. And then when we moved to D2L and we we're supposed to integrate everything and this wasn't there, we were so sad. And I've spent the last three years trying to figure out a way to do PeerMark as good as D2L did it, or sorry, as good as Turnitin did it, I haven't found a way. And I am so excited to see this. It is the best way to do peer review. I cannot sell this enough. You can see the second little tab there says peer mark questions. You can put in questions that your students have to answer and respond to. Things like, was the abstract of a sufficient length? Did it include these things in it? Were the references formatted correctly? What was your favorite part of the paper? And you put those questions in before you ever assign this and they all have to answer those questions. You can set the minimum number of words their answer has to be. So they can't just be like, yeah, great, cool, good paper. It's phenomenal. And I, I loved it. I used to have my students go out to turn it in even when we were integrated in D2L, but that also got complicated. So this is a awesome, awesome, awesome tool. Please take advantage of this. If you haven't ever used it before, it is super, super cool. Just had to put that in there. I'm so excited that this is integrated now. <laughs> I don't know when this happened. I might've missed it, but I'm very excited. This is, this is great. It's the best tool. Love it. <laughs> Sorry, I had to sell it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. No, that's fantastic. Thank you. And I love that you've had such positive experiences with it. It is a, it is a fantastic tool. So I, yeah, it, it's a great way to build it in and you can find it under your ad existing activities in D2L. So that's the, that's the trick to finding it in D2L. We had to look a little bit too, to be very honest, we had to do a little searching to find where it was as well. And then we found it. And I think we, um, I'm Karen Garcia from, from my team and I, we looked at it on Friday. We're like, there it is, it's, it's been there. So we were very excited to see that PeerMark 
is integrated into D2L. It's just a little tricky to find under your add existing activities. Thank you. Okay. And then let me erase this little guy and we will move right back into Zoom because it looks like um, Deborah had one question and then Valerie, we're gonna come up to yours. So Deborah's asking, uh, did you say you can add the questions before assignments? Cheryl, do you wanna answer that? Perfect. Yeah, so yeah. you can go in and, and actually you can copy from semester to semester or from class shell to class shell. So once you have a set of questions that you like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I'm actually gonna probably dig through my old Turnitin from a few years ago and just find my old questions. Um, but yeah, you can set it all up ahead of time. So even before you assign the peer mark assignment, you can have that set up so that when it distributes to them, they would have those questions already set up in there. Um, you can also set up the distribution. So if you want certain people to grade certain papers, you can do that or you can make it random. So there's a lot of there's a lot of tools in here to really help you in whatever way you want to do peer mark. But yeah, you can set up everything ahead of time. I usually do it around now. So before the assignments even go out, um, I'll spend some time playing with it. I'm probably gonna do that once our D2L is all set up. <laughs> so this is be my project this week is to find this and, and play with this. So yeah, very good tool. Sorry, <laughs> very excited. Oh, no, I love it, thank you. <laughs> Great, let, great, absolutely. Let's see. And Deborah, I think that answered your question. Uh, any, any more questions about peer mark? Very glad we all found this together. Okay. All right. And then let's see, Valerie, um, about presentations in Zoom. Did you want to unmute and say anything about using Zoom for presenting skills? I started using the presentation mode in Zoom in the online. So we were trying to figure out how to get presentations into one can. And one of the things I did was I went and found some links for them to help them learn how to present using Zoom. So there's a link out there that talks about the particular um, area you should have around you, right? Not too close, not too far, just perfect kind of thing. And it talks to them about how to actually give presentations in Zoom. So so many people are used to giving presentations in front of people, but they're not really used to giving them in the Zoom environment. So I found a few really good links. I found one too that talked about lighting. So if anybody who is interested, I kind of did it with this optional you know, information, but it showed how to use the light lighting and, and things like that. So it just allowed for a new skill to add to the presentation part. I have not, I was on sabbatical last semester, so I did not have the chance to try it in the classroom environment to see if it works, but online it actually works pretty well. And I have noticed that they're using the material. Great, Valerie, thank you so much for that. And, and to, to reiterate one of those points there, I was just reading uh, not too long ago, an article about interviews and how often now the, the number is, is incredibly high with how many companies now with interviews, the first step of an interview is through something like Zoom. It's a process of a video recording that, and it can be a very intimidating environment because the questions pop up. There are several companies that are doing this. The questions will pop up and then the person who is interviewing will have to respond to the questions on camera without anybody on the other side. And this is all recorded. And then the hiring committees will review those submissions. So being able to get this skill in now in a way that supports the learning in your class, the discipline specific learning, but also helps the students navigate this environment where they are recording into a computer and this different presentation skill where it feels very different than it does standing in front of a class. It's a, it's a great point to consider as you're thinking about using Zoom uh, as a way for students to have their presentations as well. So thank you everybody for sharing that. And then um, with that, I know Valerie, you mentioned that you had some tools and some references that you used to help the students. If you would like, if you wanna send those to us in the CTLE, we can share those out if that's something that others are interested in as well. So thank you. Looking for Perfect, thank you so much. All right, so let's take a look 
Um, after the I, with Zoom, again, feel free to use this in creative ways. You don't always have to use it just for your own meetings. The students can use it in a lot of different ways too. Now, beyond D2L, there are, I wanna preface these next couple of items by saying that there are a ton of tools for collaborating beyond D2L. For this presentation, I focused on some that are pretty low tech, but I think that can be used in ways that are quite powerful. So this is just to give you an idea of some of these tools. Do feel free to reach out to me or to anybody in the CTLE and we can talk about the variety of tools that are out there and we will find the one that fits your needs. But this is just to kind of get a few ideas for you. I, I've joked before and I'll joke again. I promise I'm not on Microsoft's payroll, but their tools are just so good. Uh, they are so great for collaborating. And these are going to be these tools that you're familiar with from probably a productivity standpoint. But when we look at things like Word, PowerPoint, and even Excel, you have the opportunity to turn these into collaborative spaces. And as you'll see, on each of these, and you've probably noticed it as you've been working in these tools, you have the option to share. This sharing feature is, is a very good friend of mine. Uh, I know my team uses it all the time. My students share everything through their Office 365 tools. So we're gonna look at just a few creative ways to use something like this. With Word, considering ways to have students create and co-edit documents. What's great about this is if you are sharing a Word document or your students have shared Word documents within small groups, for example, or even within the entire class, if you have them working on this during a synchronous session, you are able to see these real-time changes and updates. You can see where everyone is on the document, what they're posting. This makes for a really great way to have the class take collaborative notes, but it's also an opportunity for students to comment on each other's uh, writing and posts and then to build these documents that are dynamic and that are growing. Within this, you can also track and review changes. Uh, I know at last count, it was well over a hundred versions of each of the documents or items that you can go back to and see all of the changes that were made. And then of course you can enable track and review changes like you might do in your own work as well. And this, although we've highlighted that it can be used synchronously, it's also great for asynchronous work too. So that way the students can get into the documents and into the tools in times that are most uh, accessible to them. And then also with this, when you leave a comment, you'll see the comment that's highlighted in the top corner there. As long as everyone is logged into their accounts, you have the ability to tag and assign tasks to each other. So this is something, um, Gianna, I know just because I know you do quite a bit of peer review in your class and, and Cheryl, you as well, with something like this, you can tag students. And so if you have uh, two students who are working on a document and one of them needs to revise something in their work, you can always tag them and say, you know, at Karen, can you take a look at this? And sure enough, she'll be tagged. A notification can go to her as well. So it creates this really dynamic space for students to work. And it works very similarly to Google Docs. I know we, we've had this conversation before about Google Docs compared to Microsoft. Um, but the, with Word, the great thing about it is it all has to be verified, authenticated through St. Leo. So that way you make sure that the accounts that are being used are St. Leo accounts. And it makes it a little easier for things like the tagging and the tasking. And there have been concerns about privacy issues with Google Docs because you're using an account that is, is perhaps private and the same thing with the students, but it functions in a very, very similar way. So if you are someone who likes Google Docs, do consider checking, uh, checking out Word to see if that would fulfill your, your needs as well. Now, when we look at something like PowerPoint, this is, this is a space that I like to think of very creatively. I think our first idea with PowerPoint is that students can work on group projects together, which they absolutely can. It has those same abilities that I just showed you in Word, um, but I like to use it, uh, it's a little bit more of a creative space sometimes. This is from one of my students, their, their intro class, their discussion, rather than having them post in a discussion forum, I set up a shared PowerPoint for them and then ask them to do their day one icebreaker type, um, type questions and responses and they each get their own individual slides. And we saw something like this last week in Faculty Development Day with Flower Darby's presentation where everyone was creating their own slide. It's the same concept. 
Um, and so, and you can see the student, they just did the kind of basic stuff, their major and what they care about. And then uh, the things like food and Netflix. And then you can see, uh, because I did use Microsoft and the students had to log in with their university accounts, what we looked at over here is that they can leave their replies and their comments there. And you can see who's leaving it. And then the conversation thread can develop from there. So there are a, a lot of different or unique ways to use something like a shared PowerPoint. I tend to think of it as a, as a blank canvas when I approach using it in my class for collaborative assignments. And then something like this, this is where students, this goes back to our presentations. So the students uh, created not Zoom presentations, but just PowerPoint presentations for this particular class. And then they shared the links with me to their group presentations. And then under the discussions board, what I did is I just linked those out all as, a, as the table here and showed who was in the group and then what particular author's work that they were looking at. And then that way the students could view all of their classmates PowerPoint presentations, go through them, read notes. And I, I did this as a preparation for an exam so that they were basically creating their own ideas there. Let's see, and then Gianna, do you have a question? Feel free to jump in. Uh, thanks, Melissa. Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I'll be teaching on ground face to face. I certainly don't want to give up uh, some of the interactions that we've had, like in our writing workshops where we're doing peer critique on ground and we're together and we're talking all together face to face. That is really precious, I think. But my question is, if we were to do the, um, if we were to use the Word document that you showed a few seconds ago, how would you suggest using that in conjunction with these face-to-face -face peer review workshops? Great, uh, great question. So I think there are probably a couple of different ways to approach it. Um, one is if the students have their devices, if you have a classroom environment where you want the students to have their devices, they can be taking notes and leaving comments as they're having the conversation. So then that way what you're doing is you're reinforcing the learning because the conversation is happening and they're also getting the notes written in a way that they can respond to each other. So that's one approach would be to have it uh, at the same time to do some sort of synchronous event where they're commenting and asking questions and all looking at the same document in the same space. Really not so different than thinking about if you were to pass out papers. So if a, a student brought in an example of their short story for their small group workshop to review, uh, historically what we would do is we would have the students print out their papers and, and have three or four copies and share them with the group. This is essentially that, but you're looking at it on a device instead, and students are able to highlight and type in certain spaces. So very similar environment for something like that. The other option and something to consider uh, that I've found very effective before is to have students look at the work ahead of time on something like the Word document. So have them, if, if class is on Thursday, by Monday, they need to share out with their group their short stories or their essays, presentation, whatever it is that they're working on. And then that way, by the time that they come to class to actually workshop it, they've already reviewed it, they already have some key talking points down, and you're not spending any of that time rereading the content or that initial or that cursory read of a document where students tend to read it, they oh, okay, well, this is pretty good, maybe this or that. We go back to that processing time. If students are reading these on Monday and they have until Thursday to leave their feedback and their comments, it's going to create more robust conversations and it's also going to help with the depth of the feedback that the students give each other. So those are just a couple of ways. Yeah, thank you. That second scenario is typically the one that I use and I've been using the discussion board. So mm -hmm. how how do I, uh, with, within the, so this, uh, let me just get clear. The Word document sharing is outside of D2L. That's just through Office 365, right? <clears throat> it can be. Um, I actually incorporate it though. So it can be outside of that where the students are sending them to each other. But for, for example, with this slide here where I, where I have the PowerPoint one, with something like this, what I did is that they posted their, just like you said, they posted their presentations in this particular case. They could do this with essays to the discussion forum. And that keeps everything in a nice controlled environment. So even though the documents are Word documents, 
they can share them as links in the discussion board and then other students can open those links and then go in and do add comment, make changes. So it's really a matter of preference. For, for me, I like to keep everything in one space. So even if they are working in the Office 365 tools, I then ask them to bring that link um, or the content, at least bring it back to the learning management system so that then everybody can see it in one, one, one place, which I think is really helpful. So I, I kind of do both. I, I bring it back into the LMS. I like that. Okay. Thank you, Melissa. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. And then Cheryl, let's see, I see a hand. So go right ahead. So I was going to just say for PowerPoint, something I did even before this was, you know, COVID times. I had a 400 level biology class that was very discussion based and I would create a PowerPoint very bare bones ahead of time and share it with the students ahead of class and then they would kind of take notes on it as we went. So there were probably 12 to 15 students in that class so they were just basically creating their own study guide on that PowerPoint as we were talking through the different topics. And then it also degraded into them posting memes before class started every time, but they were cancer based memes so it was okay. Um, but it was just a nice tool, even when we were fully face to face and weren't dealing with COVID times and that would have worked well over zoom as well so it's something to consider, you know, if you are into collaborative note taking for your class, that might be an option for you as well. Absolutely. That's I am a, a big fan of collaborative note taking and essentially students, they can create their own study guide, take their own notes, and then they really do learn from each other. And, you know, Cheryl said they can have some fun and, and share memes and stuff, too. So it's it's a really great environment where the students uh, again, this I think this is one of the things that we don't talk about enough is is how this really supports all learners, because some learners want to take a lot of notes and some don't some feel more comfortable with with taking notes and they do observing and listening. So it really allows the students to develop all of these different skills and support and an inclusive environment for them to all feel like they're contributing and also learning in a way that makes the most sense to them. So thank you. And then let's see, yes. And then there's some great information if you would take a, a look at the chat from, uh, from Valerie here, introductions and campus students, PowerPoint presentations using voiceover. Yes, absolutely. So in PowerPoint to make presentations, it's actually uh, pretty simple to do voiceover work with them where you're recording narration on slides. We do have a video on that on our website. Maybe someone on my team could find that and link it. So that way, if anybody does have questions about how to narrate a PowerPoint and record it and share it with others, um, we can link you out to our website for those instructions. That's, that, Valerie, that's a great point. Thank you for bringing that up. So the last of the, oh, well, I'm kidding. It's not really the last. I've, I've uh, added in one other Microsoft tool later. But um, for this, when we look at something like Excel, so I teach English and education classes. So you probably wonder what in the world would she use Excel for? Well, what I've used it for is to create uh, references, to create a data, like kind of a mini database for the students. So something like this, when you think about sharing an Excel document, in this particular case, we were looking for articles or books or podcasts on brain-based learning. And one of the activities in the course uh, asked the learners to find a, find a resource for this, give an overview or an abstract, and then tell us what it is and link us out to where we could find that. Something like this is a great way for students to curate resources. And since it's in Excel and you can very easily turn it into a table, you can sort this information and you've essentially created your own reference page and you've added to this collection of articles or readings. And again, thinking creatively, you could do this with uh, many, many different things, but essentially you could set up an Excel document that's shared and have students add information here. I also, uh, pre, in a pre-COVID world, I also did this with uh, freshman students who were, the one of the their social action projects was they had to get involved with a team or an organization on campus. And because the students were pretty new to the university, they had to go through and on the Excel sheet, they listed the particular organization or the team that they were a part of, give some information about it, and then explain why they were a part of that team organization. So that way others could then explore all of the offerings that were available on campus to the students. So a lot of, a lot of pretty neat ways you could use something like Excel just as an organizational tool 
And again, it keeps everybody right there together. And to go back to, um, to Gianna's point earlier, even though this lives in Office 365, you could very easily just link it out uh, in a discussion or in a module anywhere within the LMS as well. So some, some pretty cool features there. And then the other point I did wanna bring up with the, with the updates to Office 365, you also see something um, like the catch up button now and the catch up button is really great because it will highlight any kind of changes that were made to a document or a, a file uh, since the last time you were there. So you can kind of go in and see how things have been progressing. Absolutely. And then um, as Debbie has said here, this is comparable to an article review. Exactly. And that's one of the, the ways that we can work in some of these additional skills as our students are learning how to research or conduct literature reviews, article reviews, all of this, they can see how they're forming it. And because it is a complex and kind of complicated task, especially for, for early learners, what we can see here is that you're, you're helping them think about how they're putting this together, which eventually uh, they can go on to use for their own work as well. Great. Okay. And then with Microsoft, our, our other point here is something like Flipgrid. I know uh, we have lots of resources on Flipgrid on our website as well. But for anybody who is unfamiliar with Flipgrid, what it is, it's a video discussion forum. So this takes the video uh, that we can do for a discussion and ask students to respond um, most of the time with their cameras on and they can do these sort of short mini clips and it's an opportunity for the students to respond to each other via video. Now, D2L does offer the ability to leave video and audio feedback in the discussion forums as well, but this is a separate tool that has um, some more robust features, more engaging features, and it can be incorporated right into your D2L shell. Flipgrid is part of the Microsoft package, so you don't need an extra account. You can log into Flipgrid with your Office 365 Microsoft account, and you can set these up in a similar way as you would your discussion forums. So if you would prefer your students to be interacting via uh, Flipgrid, via video, this is one way to do that, and it can be embedded right into D2L. The example that I'm showing on the screen here is from one of our courses here, this is our teaching at St. Leo course, it's for all new faculty, and they go through and, and they have to complete this course. And one of the discussions is about reflecting on core values and how our core values will impact and influence their role as educators at the university. So because this is something that is a bit personal and it allows the people to really kind of show their, their personalities and their connections to our core values, we decided to make this one into a Flipgrid. And so they record themselves talking about uh, particular core values and how they're going to impact them as educators. And you can see with this one, it gives you information. So you have 500 views, a couple of comments, and then it'll show you the number of hours of engagement. I can tell you in my classes where Flipgrid is used as a conversation tool, not just to post videos, but also to reply in a class of 25 on a single forum. I will typically uh, see much, much uh, greater engagement there. Um, and it's an opportunity for students to see each other. And it's something that, that they can do and have a little fun with, with filters and those types of things. But it's a great way to put together all of your students in a forum other than something like a written discussion board. And again, integrates very, very nicely right into D2L. And we can help you with that as well if you have any questions about how to set up your Flipgrid. Now, the last points I wanted to bring up are digital whiteboards. Digital whiteboards, I think, are, are tools that a lot of us are using now, and they can be used in, in these really kind of creative ways. And I'm going to show three. The first one is Padlet. Now, Padlet may be familiar to some of you from last week's Faculty Development Day with Flower Darby. She shared a couple of Padlets with us, and these were a, a great hit, a great success that day. And they... There we go. And they give an opportunity for a digital space where students can be creative, can respond to questions, they can respond to each other. And this is something that works really well. You can think of it as a, almost like sticky pads. 
uh, for a, a digital environment. And Padlet is one of those services where you get three boards free and you are welcome to uh, what I tend to do with the three free ones. I haven't paid for the full license. I just pay for the three and I'll, I'll delete them once I'm done with them in certain classes. So it is an opportunity though that can be used either asynchronously or synchronously. And then absolutely, so as Candace mentioned, this is great for asynchronous feedback as well. So it just gives the students another opportunity to interact, to post their thoughts and questions, to leave feedback. And I know, um, Candace, would you mind saying a little bit about how you use some of the digital whiteboards as a preparation tool for your classes and, and having students respond to readings and those types of activities? Sure, I'll be glad to. Um, the pure feedback I was mentioning with uh, Flipgrid, but I could see you using Padlet for peer feedback as well. Um, but a lot of times I'll assign an article and then everyone will have to post their three takeaways from the article before class begins. And what's really fun about that is that I pull up the Padlet at the beginning of class and all of the salient points from the article are, are all posted right there. And I can ask a student to elaborate on their post or whatever, they all have to come ready. And so it, and I do get points for it. So, uh, and, and quite honestly, there are lots of times that things are being posted two minutes before classes, class starts. And they know that if it's not posted before class starts, it doesn't count. So they can't all be posting at the beginning of class and get credit for it. Um, but it, it just in, uh, enormously improved the quality of the discussion of the readings, whether it's chapter readings or articles or whatever. Um, as, as you mentioned, uh, Melissa, it's a great way to build community for people to put a little bit of themselves on the, you know, on the page. There are places where you can like and comment, you might require comment. So maybe somebody posts something, everybody has to comment on at least two people's, uh, you know, post or whatever. We did a Padlet um, a number of years ago in my uh, Teaching Diverse Populations course with a uh, class in a school in Greece. And um, the interactions were just fabulous. Um, it was just so fun to, to see them interacting. We also used Flipgrid for that. And um, my students were talking to high school students in Greece, and they, these are students, they were at the American Farm School, and their goal is to come to an American university. And so they had all sorts of um, anxiety about that. What's it like there? Um, do I need to have a gun? That was when some of the school shootings had really made, uh, I mean, it was, it was really fascinating to hear their concerns. One person said, am I going to lose my identity. That's my fear is I'm gonna to come to the United States and lose my Greek identity. And the responses of my class were so heartwarming. You know, no, of course you are who you are. You're gonna stay that person. It was just so fun to see them interacting on such a personal level that really was, I think, much more real to them than just a discussion board. Um, and even though Padlet may not be video, that opportunity to post images, you can post videos, you can post uh, links to different uh, web resources. I mean, it's a, it is a fabulous platform for interacting in a whole host of ways. So that's probably more than you needed me to say, Melissa, sorry. No, that, that is great. And I think those are some fantastic ideas and it really helps everybody think about how to use these in different ways. And Candace, I love what you mentioned there about how it builds that community. And it also, it allows us to kind of watch these conversations happen and to see what sort of observations there are. They're, they're really wonderful tools to be able to incorporate these in synchronous and asynchronous environments. So that works really, really well. So thank you, Candace. And I see um, Georgina has also said that she uses Padlet for feedback after assignments and gives, gives you feedback on the student experience, right? So um, I'm, I'm sure many of us will recall the exit tickets that we would have students do where they would write the muddiest points of the day or the takeaways and then turn them in on little index cards. Well, this is just pretty much we given us the opportunity to make that virtual and, and expand on it in all different ways. And then just as a reminder, um, Padlet, uh, much like Flipgrid, can be embedded directly into D2L. This is a Padlet from that same course I mentioned earlier about teaching at St. Leo. On this particular one, it's from our active learning section, and it's asking faculty to think about a way that they engage their students. And so rather than having them post that all on the discussion board, it's an active Padlet and uh, lots and lots of responses on there. This scrolls down for, for a very long way. 
and you get to see this opportunity um, and it creates a different way to look at the comments as well. You're not scrolling through uh, all of these discussions. Instead, you're seeing these as these little bubbles, which helps us to kind of compartmentalize the ideas too and make connections between them. So really interesting ways to approach that. And uh, again, it can be embedded right into D2L. So it's very handy. Nobody has to leave the LMS if you prefer them not to. And then our uh, Miro is one that I wanted to mention, much like Padlet, you get a certain number of boards for free. Uh, and then after that, you have to pay for them. This is one that our team and the CTLE use when we were thinking about upcoming course offerings. And I really wanted this to be an opportunity for everybody to thank and respond to the questions um, rather than ha having it take up a, like a meeting time, for example. And so this is very much, um, they describe it as an infinite canvas. And there are tons of templates that you can use. That this is great for things um, like brainstorming and mind mapping and different um, project planning activities. So Miro is another one that you can explore. It has a, a lot of features. So this one is a bit more uh, advanced, but it gives you the opportunity to do a lot of different things. So we also can help you with Miro. And then the last one, uh, as I said, I have to do at least one more nod to the Microsoft products. So this is Microsoft Whiteboard, which is a digital whiteboard that functions in a similar way. This can be found under your Office 365 tools, and you will see uh, this opportunity to use markers so you can write if you're someone who has tools that uh, you like to write on the screen. Of course, you can use text boxes, draw shapes, those types of things. So again, just another platform for you. And with that one, you can share it as well. And you can see the, the option that I've shown there is to share link, you can turn it on or off, and then you can just copy that link so people can use this whiteboard as well. So to wrap up, I have just a couple of considerations for you as you think about collaboration. I really wish that I could remember where I read this, but I can't. So I just will say these are not my words. But um, when an article that I was reading was talking about as we move into fall 2021 to think about for your courses, regardless of the delivery modality, move your headquarters online. So you still have the face-to-face -face opportunities. We can still be synchronous. However, the next few months evolve, but by having everything, your headquarters online, you will be well prepared to start the new term. And this can happen with collaboration as well. We don't wanna lose that ability to collaborate just because we have uh, our, our courses moved online or if we're in class and not having all of our students there, tons of different variables with that situation. So think about moving your headquarters online. With collaboration, think about what it is you want to accomplish. Remember, don't collaborate just for collaborate's sake. Uh, think about how this particular activity or exercise is going to be best accomplished through collaboration. Know that technology should be used to support the collaboration. This can create a more equitable and inclusive environment for students, and it gives everybody the opportunity to, to work through different ideas and collaborative projects together. And don't make it complicated. Uh, if there's one piece of advice that I could leave you with today, it's that often those simple, familiar technologies are ones that can be used in really powerful ways. So never feel overwhelmed with the technology. Uh, one of my favorite tools uh, is really Word, and it, it works in a, in a great way. So just thinking about what do you want to accomplish and how's that going to work? So your next steps, um, after you've determined what you'll be using collaboration for in your class, uh, feel free if you need some help working through that or just need somebody to brainstorm some ideas with to schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation with any of our friendly faces in the CTLE. And we also have links and website, uh, tons of ideas and resources, and also support for all of these tools that I have mentioned can be found on our website. And then don't forget about our upcoming webinars or any of our courses for teaching and learning. Um, we have a, a full calendar and we are very excited to share this time with you. And in these last couple of uh, thoughts here, just wanted to say thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or unmute your mic. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Yeah. Great thank session. You. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Gianna, let's see, where would you embed the Padlet on content when you go to create a new item? 
Uh, you could create a file, for example, you could do a link, but that's gonna take you out. So I would just create a new file. So just like you were creating a page in D2L, and then from there you can embed it. And I can send you some instructions on that. Yep, and then, yes, uh, absolutely, Georgina, recycling the padlets by deleting them. In my meetings, it's video chat. I just want to say thanks again. I am super psyched about Peer Mark. <laughs> I already texted Audrey Shore. I'm like, oh my God, we finally have Peer Mark back. And she was like, yes. So I'm not the only one who's very psyched about this. This is huge for us. So, oh, I love that you were here. So, best news yeah. of, <laughs> Fantastic. of this whole week. So, I appreciate it very much. I may have to, I was playing with it a little bit. I may have to reach out to you guys because I did look at it and it's not totally. 100% clear, but I'll play before I, I bug okay. you guys with that. Yeah. So we'll put, we'll play together. Yeah, yeah. Let us know. Like I said, we, right. we just found that it was there finally. We're like, oh, look, it is there. So yeah, yeah. so we can play oh. together anytime. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I got to go have grocery delivery right now, but thanks so much for this, you guys. I appreciate it as Bye. always. Thank you.